Welcome to the Giotape Lecture Series. Today's speaker is Mark Lackenby, who is going to tell us about knot theory and machine learning. Take it away, Mark. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for the opportunity to to speak at your your your, your seminar. So, um, yeah, what I'm going to be talking about today is, um, for me, quite a, a new uh, development. Um, it's um, you can see by my list of collaborators here. There's um, I collaborated with Andras Yuhash, who is uh, my colleague at Oxford, but also um, Alex Davis and Nenad Tomasev, who are um, who work for DeepMind. Um, and so, uh, the goal of this project was to see if um, machine learning could be used to um, uh, produce new theorems in mathematics, uh, in particular in my area of knot theory. So. <clears throat> um, so the background is that knot theory is um, really quite a diverse field um, that broadly groups into three main research directions. This is very much a broad brush, um, but there's certainly these three directions. There's hyperbolic knot theory, which is uh, concerned with the um, uh, hyperbolic structure that exists on many knot link complements and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, there's a very large area of knot theory which is focused on uh, Fleur theoretic invariance, so things like um, Higard Fleur homology, um, cyborg witten theory, etc. Um, and then there's quantum topology which was um, uh, founded in some sense by uh, Jones's discovery of his polynomial, but there are now many, many um, uh, things that have come from that, uh, things like the quantum invariance, things like um, um, uh, Kobanoff homology, and so on. And um, <clears throat> the thing about these three different fields is that they're not very well connected to each other. And let me illustrate this by um, showing that you the list of speakers at two conferences that happened this summer. Um, so on the left here, you can see the speakers um, at Alan Reed's conference. So Alan uh, works in hyperbolic three manifold theory. And on the right, you can see the speakers at a conference in Trieste. And you can see the, the topics that were there, the interplay of three dimensional and four dimensional topology, Fleur homology theories, Kovanoff homology, and geometric and analytic aspects of gauge theoretic equations. So the one on the left is uh, sort of covering the first area of knot theory, and the one on the right is covering the second and the third areas. And the striking thing about this list of speakers is they are disjoint. There is no one who spoke at both conferences, um, and that is very much a manifestation of how um, the, the, the different fields of knot theory are quite um, um, uh, separated from one another. And one of our goals in this project was to try to bring different areas of knot theory a little bit closer. So um, the uh, uh, branch of knot theory related to um, Fleur theories and um, the branch related to quantum topology does have some links. So um, notably, for example, uh, the uh, connection between um, uh, Kovanoff homology and um, the uh, instanton invariance, as by pioneering work of uh, Kronheimer and Rofka. Um, but hyperbolic knot theory is very much on its own. So <clears throat> the idea was to find connections between these fields, and we focused um, on the various invariants that come out of these fields. So on the left hand side, in hyperbolic knot theory, you're dealing with um, a hyperbolic structure on a knot complement, um, Riemannian metric, and so there are various sort of natural invariants attached to it, things like the volume, the length spectrum, the lengths of geodesics. And there are more refined invariants, for example, the cusp shape and volume, trace field, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a whole string of possible invariants of uh, hyperbolic knots. 
And on the other side, um, there's things like Higard fleur homology, instanton fleur homology, um, and um, uh, some of the quantities attached to them, things like tau, epsilon, upsilon, etc. And we actually focused on a slightly simpler version, simpler uh, three slash four dimension invariant, namely the not signature. Um, so this definitely lives on the right hand side. It definitely is, in fact, highly correlated with um, many of these invariants. Um, and it also has a, a, um, a interpretations in terms of four dimensions, which is very much a feature of, um, of the Fleur theoretic invariants. Um, and we focused on the knot signature primarily because it's easy to calculate. So in this game, the game that I'm going to be talking about with machine learning, you need a lot of data. And um, it, so having invariants that are eminently calculable en masse is very important. And signature is very easy to calculate. The other ones can be calculated as well. And in principle, we would like to study them too. But it seemed like signature was a good starting point. So, as I say, the goal was to try to find connections between these invariants. So let me just define what the knot signature is. I'm sure you all know, but uh, it's worth just making sure that we're all on the same page. So you start with your knot in three space. Um, and you take any ciphered surface for this. So this is a compact, orientable surface embedded in three space whose boundary is the knot k. And then there's an associated um, uh, bilinear form on the first homology of that surface, defined as follows. So you take as, it takes as input two elements of first homology, which you just realize by, say, two loops, L1 and L2. And then you form the quantity you can see there. So you take L1 and L2. And then you form L2 plus. L2 plus is obtained by taking the loop L2 and pushing it off in transverse direction to the ciphered surface. So you now have two disjoint loops and you look, take their linking number. So if you just take the first term, this is uh, the form that you get by called the ciphered form. And it's used to, for example, calculate um, the Alexander polynomial. But we want to take the symmetrized cipher form, so you add on the same thing, but with the role of L1 and L2 reversed. So that's now a symmetric bilinear form, and so it has an associated signature, and that turns out not to depend on the choice of cipher surface that you made. Um, and it's a not theoretic invariant. It's defined in the 1950s by Murasugi, and uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's very important. OK, so um, this is definitely a three slash four dimensional invariant. The way it connects with dimension four is um, uh, you think of R3 as the boundary of R4 plus. So R4 plus is upper half space in R4. And schematically, you have your knot sitting inside R3. You kind of have a picture a bit like this. And a very important part of four-dimensional topology is the study of surfaces that the knot bounds in R4+. Plus. And the formal genus of the knot is defined to be the minimal possible genus of such a surface. And actually, it turns out that in this game, it's very important to specify the quality of that surface. So you could think of smooth surfaces that the knot bounds. But actually, um, it's best to in this situation, it's best to focus on topologically, topological locally flat surfaces. So this quantity, um, it's sometimes zero. So for even when the knot is non-trivial, in fact, for the knot shown, it's actually zero. It bounds a, uh, uh, a disk in R4+. Plus. But it can be positive, and um, knowing when um, it's positive, or indeed what the number is, is a really major part of uh, four-dimensional topology. And um, as Murasugi proved, it's bounded below 
this quantity, the four-ball genus, is bounded below by half the absolute value of the signature. So the signature, you can see, is giving you four-dimensional information. OK, so <clears throat> how do we use machine learning? So we set ourselves the following goal, which was, can we predict the, the not signature just knowing the knot's hyperbolic invariance? Okay, so that was the goal. So the hope was that the answer would be yes, and therefore that there would be some connection between the hyperbolic geometry and the knot signature. And before there was really no known connection between these two different fields. So how do we use machine learning? Well, what we did was we created a big data set. Um, so there's this miraculous program, Snappy, which uh, can compute hyperbolic structures on knot complements. We created a sample set of 2.7 million knots. Um, that was actually made up of 1.7 million knots in the Regina census. So basically all hyperbolic knots with at most 16 crossings. And then we randomly picked a further million knots with at most 80 crossings. And it's legitimate to ask, how do we do that? And the answer is we get Snappy to do it. Snappy has a, a function where you can randomly pick a knot. And it samples uniformly at random from the space of all link diagrams. And then from that, it forms a knot. And typically, that's hyperbolic. And uh, that's what we used. So then, as in this, as you do in the world of machine learning, you divide your set into two groups, a training set and a test set, and do so randomly. And then you use a neural network to try to predict the signature from the knot's hyperbolic invariance. We gave it a long list of hyperbolic invariants, all the ones that you could see that I showed before, things like volume, cusp shape, etc., etc. I'll focus a bit more on which ones turned out to be important later. And we see, we try to see whether or not those invariants could be used to predict the signature. And then you test, once you've trained on a training set, you use the test set to test that network and you see how good is it. And the conclusion was that the network could predict the signature with impressive accuracy. And this was not obvious. This is in itself something shows that something interesting is going on. It, our hypothesis was that there was some connection between signature and the hyperbolic invariance. If there had been no connection between the hyperbolic invariance and the signature, then no matter how good your neural network, no matter how clever your collaborators at DeepMind, there would have been no way of predicting the signature from the hyperbolic invariance. The fact that the neural network could predict the signature shows that there is a connection between those two fields. So the question is, what is that connection? How are the hyperbolic invariants, um, uh, how are they controlling the signature? So before we go any further, yes, Time for some questions. So, so how incomplete are the hyperbolic invariants? Do we know? The well, it's a good question. So, the hyperbolic invariant, the hyperbolic structure itself, is a complete invariant. We didn't give the machine though the complete invariant. We gave it things like the volume. Now, the volume is finite to one. There are only finitely many knots with a given volume. We also gave it the length spectrum, um, which is again an extremely good measure. So um, I think I can't say for one hundred percent certain, but I think that of the invariants we gave, there were no duplications. So in mm -hmm. some sense, the 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 invariants did determine the knot at least on our data set. I see. Thanks. Any other questions about this as a plan? No? Okay. So this is saying something's interesting is happening, but the question is what? 
Now, one of the problems with machine learning is that it's a black box. Your neural network can predict the signature from the hyperbolic invariance, but it won't tell you how it does that. And that is frustrating. But there are some things that you can do to probe a little bit, um, find out what's going on. And in particular, you can do, uh, you can form this, this so-called saliency plot. So what this does is this gives you a measure of how important the various input invariants are in computing the output number, which in this case is what it thinks is the signature. And it does this using a fairly simple um, procedure. It just wiggles the input invariants a little bit and it, you see how the uh, output changes. So here are a list of 10, not a complete list, but here is a list of uh, 10 of uh, the, the invariants that the machine was using most. And the length of the bar is how much it was using that quantity. And you can see that the top three are standing out as being the most important by a long way. They are the real and imaginary parts of meridional translation and longitudinal translation. And I'll define briefly what those, in a bit what those are, those quantities. But you look at that and you think, well, for me, this was very surprising. The first three are all related to the cusp shape. And so what this is saying is that the signature is somehow controlled by the cusp geometry. And this for me was very, very surprising. So let me give you uh, the definitions of um, uh, what uh, these quantities are. Mark. So first of all, I what's a hyperbolic question. structure? Yes. I'm sorry, just before you start talking about this, you mentioned Chern Simons at the very end of your list. Can you, what is that? Can you say briefly? So yeah, so it's because a... of course I know I know a little bit of the theory of Chern Simons. I wonder if if uh, what I'm thinking is related to what is written there. Yeah, so um, it's a um, a quantity which is defined as a um, an integral um, over the manifold. Um, uh, it is what you, I think it is. What you think it is? Um, it's ah. uh, uh, it's that often viewed as the imaginary part of the volume. Um, so you look, uh, and a good quantity to look at is the volume plus I times the Chern-Simons. The Chern-Simons invariant is only defined, it's defined um, mod two pi. Um, right. And um, it, it, in fact, the way that uh, Snappy calculates it is it calculates it from a, a decomposition of um, the manifold into geometric tetrahedra and then it uh, each tetrahedron has an associated quantity and from that it creates the chern simons invariant it would be fair to say that uh, at least uh, uh, the ones uh, mentioned at the very bottom of this list uh, do not uh, play a significant role in uh, in detecting yeah, exactly yeah. so the chern simons turned out to be and it was in the mix. We did, we had no idea. In fact, it seemed reasonable that it, at the outset that it might be involved, but as you can see, it it basically wasn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So, what is a hyperbolic structure? Well, um, it's a Riemannian metric on the knot complement that is complete and that has finite volume and has constant negative curvature minus one. Um, and Mostow's rigidity theorem says that if you have such a metric, then it's unique up to isometry. And Thurston's Munster theorem, for which he, he basically got his Fields Medal, um, says that if you start with a non-trivial knot, then its complement has a hyperbolic structure if and only if um, two things don't happen. One is it's not a torus knot. In other words, it's not doesn't live on a standardly embedded torus sitting inside R3. For example, here on the right, the trefoil knot. And it's not a satellite knot. So the way that you form a satellite knot is you take a non-trivial knot, in this case a trefoil, 
you thicken it up to a solid torus. And then within that solid torus, you draw your knot. And that knot inside that solid torus, it has to have two properties. It can't be a core curve of the solid torus, and it can't lie inside a three ball within the solid torus. Both of those would be trivial in some sense. So if you can build your knot that way, then it's a satellite knot. And Thurston's theorem says that as long as these two things don't happen, and generically they don't, then the knot admits hyperbolic structure. So there are many different invariants then, because, and which are then unique because of the uniqueness up to isometry. You can therefore know that the volume of the knot is well defined. Um, but we're going to focus on the cusp geometry. So um, what's that? Well, this is a non-compact manifold. We've taken S3 and we have drilled out the knot and we've got a non-compact manifold. So the resulting non-compact manifold has an end, which is of the form torus cross half open interval. And when the knot has a hyperbolic structure, that end has a canonical geometry. But let me, so let me describe that. So we think of hyperbolic three space, it has its natural model, which is upper half space. Um, which has a suitable Riemannian metric on it. And what you do is you look at the horrible consisting of all points with Z coordinate greater than or equal to one. And then you act on that horrible by a group of Euclidean translations, which um, are generated by two elements moving in independent directions. And so a fundamental domain for that action, when it's just if you just focus on just a single level, so z equals one, a fundamental domain for that action is just given by a parallelogram. And when you quotient out by that action, then you just take your parallelogram and you identify the opposite sides. And you get a torus. But we're taking not just z equals one, but z greater than or equal to one. And so each slice gives you a torus, and so you end up with torus cross half open interval. And that is how the end of your hyperbolic manifold looks like. That's what it looks like geometrically. Now, actually, we've got a little, still haven't quite pinned it down. Um, it turns out that what I could, I mean, I could have chopped off my end at z equals one, or I could have chopped off my end at, say, z equals two, and both would have been a cusp. So what one tends to do is one tends to try to expand the end as much as possible by reducing z below one until it bumps into itself, until it's no longer embedded. And then that's called a maximal cusp. And that's typically what we look at. OK, so what are the various invariants attached to um, a cusp? Well, Snappy, this amazing program, it spits out it will give you the cusp geometry. And like here on the right here, you can see um, an output from Snappy um, for the knot 6-1. And you can see the parallelogram, which is the fundamental domain for the action. You can see lots of other cool stuff like various horribles and various sorts of triangles and things, um, which uh, has lots of interesting things, but I won't go into um, today. So this boundary torus, um, it's uh, equal to the complex plane quotiented out by the z cross z action. And so you can think of one of your lattice points for the fundamental domain at being at the origin. And then all of the other lattice points, are um, uh, the, all the translates of that are just um, elements of z cross z corresponding to the fundamental group of the torus. So there's one that corresponds to the longitude, and there's another that corresponds to the meridian. And you can normalize things so that the longitude is, a re is real, it's horizontal in this picture, and so that the meridian has positive imaginary part. Okay, that's just by rotating the picture around suitably. So you end up with a real number lambda, which is called longitudinal translation, and a complex number mu, which is meridional translation. 
And so you have split mu up into its real and imaginary part. And those three quantities, longitudinal translation, real and imaginary part of meridional translation, those were the three main quantities controlling signature. And they're exactly the three quantities that determine the shape of this cusp. So, as I say, for me, this was extremely unexpected. Um, and um, uh, I wanted to try to understand things more. So what do we got? We, the machine is telling us that signature has been predicted from just lambda and mu. And the question is, how? Well, at this point, you need to um, do some uh, sort of good old fashioned mathematical detective work. Um, you need just do some plotting, basically. So here's a plot, one of the plots that we formed. So this is <clears throat> has signature on the y-axis, and it has the real part of meridional translation on the x-axis. And in order to try to get more information, we also colored the plot um, by uh, colored by longitudinal translation lambda. So each one of these dots is a is a knot. It's a hyperbolic knot. This is one of our. There's a lot of multiplicity here, but there are can't see them all, but there are 2.7 million dots there. And um, so you look at that and you say, that's definitely not random, right? That is something is going on here. You can't see exactly what, but you can see that definitely signature is not just randomly related to meridional translation. But it's hard to tell exactly what's going on. <clears throat> the first thing that you can see is that the dots, they're mostly focused in the top right quadrant and the bottom left quadrant. So if we just focused on the sign of the signature, we can see that the sign of the signature is very highly correlated with the sign of the meridional translation. Now, Original translation was this, let me just go back a second, was this complex n number mu. And the real part of it is just how right or left it is in this picture. So it's saying that if this parallelogram is skewed one way, then the signature tends to have one sign. And if it's skewed the other way, then it tends to have the other sign. And that is, well, say very surprising to me. And what it does is it kind of suggests that maybe what's going on is that um, somehow the signature is seeing how skewed this parallelogram is. And so we try to come up with a quantity involving lambda and mu that measures the skewness of the parallelogram. And we came up with this quantity called the natural slope. So I like to think uh, um, sort of geometrically, um, and uh, so here we've got a, a geometry on this torus, um, which is um, a Euclidean structure. Um, and um, we have lambda and mu, and you can realize them as geodesics on this Euclidean torus. So um, uh, I'm going to realize mu, pick a geodesic representative for, for mu. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take any point on that geodesic and fire off a perpendicular geodesic, mu plus. That will then run along the knot and eventually come back to where it started from. And in doing so, it'll have run along a longitude plus some number of meridians. Now, that number needn't necessarily be a whole number, as you can see, if here in this picture here, it's not coming back exactly where it started from. Um, but it's some real number. And that real number, that so it's one longitude plus some number S of meridians, that number S is what we define to be the natural slope. And actually we took minus it just to make sure that all our signs worked out. And a little bit of <clears throat> um, just Euclidean geometry says that it's determined in terms of lambda and mu as the real part of lambda divided by mu. So this quantity is clearly is capturing the skewness of this parallelogram. 
right? So if the parallelogram was actually a rectangle, then when I pick my point on mu, mu would be now a vertical thing. When I picked on my point and fired, it off, fired off a geodesic orthogonally, it would run exactly along the longitude and come back to where it started from. And so this number s would be zero. So when when the when when you have a um, uh, in your parallelogram is a rectangle, the, the natural slope is zero. Um, but when it when it's skewed, it, it picks up this number quantity. This quantity's natural slope picks up the skewness. So what we did was we then plotted um, the uh, the natural slope on the x-axis versus the signature on the y-axis, and this is the output we got. And you can see here that uh, these, so each, there are lots and lots of dots here, but they're following basically what looks like roughly a straight line. This is our two different data sets. There's random knots and there's the Regina data set, but they're both following a straight line. And so now it seems like we're in a place to uh, formulate um, a rough conjecture. The rough conjecture is that the signature is pretty much a constant times the natural slope. And that's what the data was bearing out. So what we've gone from is from machine learning to say that there is some connection between signature and hyperbolic geometry. And then from the saliency plot to say that actually the three main quantities are uh, picking out, that the, will pick out the cusp geometry of controlling the signature. To this, which is saying that actually the signature is roughly the, the, the constant times the slope. Now, as I tell my undergraduates, uh, this this little twiddle thing doesn't actually really mean anything. Um, uh, we need to quantify it a little bit further by saying, what's the error? And so really, here's a better conjecture, which is that there are constants C0 and C1, so that the absolute value of the difference between the that the, the signature and C0 times the slope is has bounded error. And a natural way of quantifying the error, a natural measure of the size of the knot is the volume. So it's the most a constant times the volume. So that's where we were. Um, and um, it seemed like you looked at the data, it seemed like very convincing that this was true. And we spent quite a bit of time trying to prove it. Um, and um, we just weren't getting anywhere. Um, and it turns out the reason we weren't getting anywhere is because it's actually false. Despite this plot, these plots, which strongly suggest that there's a linear, roughly linear relationship between these two quantities, slope and signature, this is actually false. And I'll explain shortly, uh, how we can show it's false and then how we can correct it to a correct conjecture. Before I go, go any further, does anyone have any questions? Mark, yeah. I have a yeah. rather rather naive uh, comment and I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you, you, you almost laugh at it. But anyway, um, if you go back to the diagram where you showed in colors uh, the representation of your uh, not family. Yeah. I guess uh, every whatever a, a point or a dot represents um, all your not. The, the, I mean, the set of points represent all your knots you considered. Is is any use of considering instead of uh, this two uh, D view a three D view of uh, say a manifold in terms of lambda and uh, um, finding out the metric of this manifold uh, because you, you would combine evidently uh, the signature, the uh, meridional translation and lambda in one information. And I wonder yeah. if you thought about that and uh, of any use of that. Yeah, um, so, that, you know, right, that, that's, a, that's a, uh, a very natural thing to try to do. I mean, the problem is there's also an extra quantity, which is the imaginary part of um, ah, original sure. translation as well. And so you've got one quantity depending on three others. So to plot that, that's something in 4D, which is hard to visualize. Um, and we tried to keep it simple, we, but, but we actually did multiple versions of these plots. And um, uh, yeah, it's, it's not clear what the, the right, like 
how you get your how how you go from a picture to really trying to work out what's going on. Um, but yeah, it we 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 didn't actually form any 3d plots um but uh that would have been the next step if we hadn't made it further progress okay thanks okay so um let's move on so um let me show you how we disprove the conjectures um so the problem is that let me just go back a bit. You've got these conjectures that there's the saying that signature and a constant times the slope is bounded. They differ by a quantity that's at most the volume, a constant times the volume. The problem is that you can't disprove such a thing by any given example. Um, because you could always just change C0 and C1 to, to, to fit the data. So obviously to, to, to try and disprove such a thing, you need to find a sequence of examples. And it, it's it's best, it's not essential, but it's best to find a sequence of examples with bounded volume. And it turns out there's a well-known construction of forming a sequence of knots with bounded volume. As follows, you start off with a knot K in the three sphere, and you have a collection of curves C1 up to Cn that in the complement of K, the bound disjoint disks in the three sphere. So just a collection of un disjoint unknots. The knot K is allowed to smash through the interiors of those disks. And then you suppose, and you can arrange this, um, that uh, the, the, the resulting link K union C1 up to Cn is hyperbolic. And then what you do is you form the knot K Q1 up to Qn, which is takes for each of these Cis just adds qi full twists to the knot to the strings going through through that, that that disc bounded by ci so for each n tuple of integers you have a knot and what we did was um, we looked at the slope and the signature and the volume of these now it turns out that when analyzing such things we also need to Look at the following quantities, the linking number between K and CI. And we suppose that these, that the numbers are arranged, that the first M of them, the first M of them are even and the, the rest are odd. Then the conclusion is that <clears throat> we can get the slope asymptotically and we can get the signature asymptotically and also the volume. So Thurston's hyperbolic Dane surgery theorem says that for large enough QIs, the volume of these knots, the, the resulting knots are hyperbolic and have bounded volume. And with some work, you can work out what the signature and the slope is. Some complicated formula, but the most important thing to see is here that the way that the slope is working is different from the way that the signature is working. And so by choosing your lambda i's appropriately, you can arrange that the slope and the signature grow at different rates and therefore that they couldn't possibly be linearly related. So you find one sequence of examples where if they were linearly related, C0 would have to be one constant. And another sequence of examples where if they were linearly related, C0 would have to be another constant. And so there isn't a single C0 that works. And so that disproves the conjectures. And at this point we were a little bit depressed, it has to be said, um, because we had all this data that was saying that something was clearly going on, but the conjecture that the data was pointing to was was wrong. But nevertheless, the insight that gained from proving these theorems turned out to be enough to, um, uh, to, to go to the right conjecture. So the right conjecture is as follows so the theorem that we're finally able to prove is that signature differs from half the slope by a controlled geometric quantity but not a constant times the volume but a constant times the volume times by the inverse cube of the injectivity radius so the way the injectivity radius is defined you you that if you just look at the whole manifold, then the injectivity radius is zero. So you don't want to take that. What you do is you truncate the maximal cusp 
and then just look at all points in the maximal in the complement of that maximal cus and look at the injectivity at those points and take the infimum of that and this turns out to be a quantity which is eminently computable and um, uh, uh, you th it, it sh it's this that should be forming part of the the error um, it also you could say well maybe I didn't want to look at the injectivity radius um, could I get a quantity whose error like a relationship between these things whose error was just dependent on the volume and there is also a theorem that says that it says that signature and half the natural slope um, uh, plus a correction term uh, differ by at most a constant times by the volume and the way the correction term works is <clears throat> what you do is you look at all of the geodesics in your manifold with length less than some number. Um, so at 0.1, it turns out works. And um, the uh, um, the, so those are turns out that when they're length mo less than 0.1, these are embedded geodesics and they have a linking number with your knot and you just focus on the ones that have odd linking number. And for each such one, each geodesic has a, 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 a length, but it turns out that it also has a complex length, which measures not just the length of the geodesic, but how much it twists as you parallel translate along it. And then associated to that complex length, there's a, a, a correction term, which we call kappa of the geodesic. You add that up. It's just, there's only finitely many such geodesics in your manifold, so there's a finite sum. And you add that to half the slope, and it turns out that that, that is the correct approximation to the signature. So these are the two theorems that we eventually hit upon, um, and um, <clears throat> in some sense, that's the sort of uh, the culmination of starting with the machine learning to find a relationship, delving deeper to find out what quantities are controlling the signature, and um, uh, and then finally coming to a theorem to theorems that actually um, uh, that, that actually prove that relationship so um, I don't particularly I, 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 I don't think I've probably got time to really explain how the theorems are approved um, I, I might a little bit but before I um, do that I, let me just give you some consequences so as I say one of the reasons like you know, what one of the goals of our of our of our project was to find these connections between these different areas of knot theory, and we think that was just interesting in its own right. But actually, once you found connections between different areas, the hope is that you can use information from one area to provide information about the other area. So, for example, we already know that the signature of a knot um, forms uh, the uh, is used to bound the four ball genus from below and the four ball genus this very important quantity is before this was not known to be related to the hyperbolic structure at all but now because of these connections there is now a known relationship one is that the four ball genus of a knot is bounded below at least by quarter of the absolute value of the slope minus this quantity um, which is purely geometric so you have a purely geometric lower bound on four ball janus now for any given knot this doesn't provide any new information than the signature did because it goes via the signature but nevertheless i do think it's interesting that you can from just purely geometric information from the hyperbolic structure get lower bounds on four ball janus that's just applying theorem one just at which says that the Four ball genus, so it says that the signature and the half the slope are related. Um, there's also a version involving theorem two, which is actually stronger, where you have, which doesn't end up with a, an error involving injectivity radius. So I think that's pretty interesting. So this is using going from the hyperbolic geometry to four ball genus. Another consequence is to the theory of of Dane surgery. So. Um, um, you know, in the theory of Dane surgery, this is a class, very classical and important way of building three manifolds. 
So what you do is you start with some knot, you drill it out, forming a three manifold with torus boundary. And then you take, you've drilled out a solid torus and you now glue that solid torus back in, in a different way. And that's called surgery. And um, it, uh, it's an important way of building three manifolds. And it's very much studied. And it turns out there are infinitely many different ways of gluing that, 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 that solid torus back in that are parameterized by a fraction, Q over P. So let K, Q over P be the manifold that you get by Dane filling using that, that data. And it's a theorem due to Thurston that for finally, for all but finitely many values of Q over P, the resulting manifold also admits a hyperbolic structure. And so a very large, body of research is asks what possible values of q over p result in something non-hyperbolic and these are called exceptional and well it turns out that cusp geometry which is one half of this equation um, is known to control exceptional surgeries um, so each so you, what you do when you do your surgery what you're doing is you're attaching on a solid torus and what really matters is where the meridian disk of that solid torus, its boundary is attached along a Q over P curve on the on the boundary torus. And um, now that Q over P curve, it has a, a length associated with it because it's this boundary torus has a, a Euclidean structure just coming from the boundary of the cusp. And um, uh, I proved a theorem, and so did Ian Agol some years ago, that says that actually if that length of that slope is greater than six, then uh, the resulting um, manifold is, 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 is hyperbolic. So this was already known. This is, this is known that cusp geometry controls um, uh, exceptional surgeries. But now what we know is there's a relationship between cusp geometry and signature. And so therefore signature controls exceptional surgeries. Um, and you get the following theorem that, um, uh, it, that uh, if, if, if Q over P is an exceptional slope, then it has to lie in a short interval focused around minus the natural slope of the knot. So this wasn't known before. Um, and I think that's also interesting. I think it's worth exploring further, understanding how signature is controlling um, exceptional surgeries. Uh, I might expect that there might be similar results with instead of signature, say, for example, um, quantities related to Higard flow homology also giving a similar sort of result. It's sort of very suggestive of future directions. Okay, so those are some applications. Um, and uh, concrete, here's a, well, here's a concrete example of famous minus two, three, seven pretzel knot, which has a lot of exceptional slopes. I've known these slopes for ages, sort of, they are 16, 17, 18, 37 over 2, 19 and 20. And I've always thought it was a strange list of numbers. They're all kind of close to each other. And this actually says that they had to be, they all turn out to be, have to be close to minus the slope and um, minus, and, and, and uh, uh, minus twice the signature. Okay, so those are some applications. Um, I'm not going to go into the, the proof of the theorems, but let me just remind you of the theorems again. It says that, so theorem one says that signature is roughly half the natural slope. Uh, plus some error. And that natural slope is defined in terms of the cusp geometry. Theorem two, which is a bit more refined, says it's roughly half the natural slope plus some quantity involving short geodesics. And so having proved that theorem, this is just the proof. Oh, I'm not going to go into it here. Having proved that theorem, what we did was we looked back at this saliency plot and 
we were kind of blown away actually because the machine actually knew all along what was going on we looked at that plot and said ah the first three quantities are what's controlling the signature and the rest are just just noise but actually the fourth quantity is the imaginary part of short the shortest ge ge short geodesics and the injectivity radius is the length of the shortest geodesic and these quantities are exactly the quantities that are involved in this correction term so actually we would have saved ourselves a lot of time and quite a lot of heartache if we had actually taken the fourth and the fifth quantity here more seriously we thought that this was saying that cusp geometry was controlling everything but it turns out it's also the short geodesics and that may well if we if we trusted the machine um, more then we may well have got more quickly to um, a correct conjecture in theorem two which would have actually ended up being something that we we could have proved so i think it's pretty striking that the machine in some sense knew all along and at that point i think i'll leave it there Oh, terrific, Mark. So now we're open for questions. I've got one about uh -huh. short geodesics. So the short geodesics, uh, like multiples of the meridian curves, they have link, linking numbers two, three, four, so on. And what do they look mm -hmm. like? Um, so they're not. They're they're, they're not. Yes. Yeah, so they they they're not meridians. Uh, meridians are actually uh, one of the few curves that can't be realized as a geodesic in your in your in your manifold um but they they can have linking numbers that are not one or you know they 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 can in in fact actually in the examples that i constructed um of these highly twisted knots where you take your initial knot k and surround it by a curve and then form these high twists and you end up with yeah, this highly twisted knot. It turns out that the remnants of the curve CI form a short geodesic. And so they end up by having linking number with the knot, which is which is the original linking number of CI. So that's actually, yeah, so in that, that theorem where we had these L1 up to LN, those linking numbers, yeah, they they can be anything. And um, uh, they, they it turns out that that linking number is quite crucial. Okay. So, um, could you make the machines look at mixtures of um, attributes? So, for example, in this graph, instead of having each row being one invariant, you want uh, you make each row being a mixture or a linear combination of the invariants. Like, yeah. like, can you make the machine uh, find those coefficients? Well, yeah, it's a, it's a really good good question, right? So, um, uh, one of the problems is that um, if you start, I mean, the problem is that, that these quantities they're not independent of each other, right? Um, uh -huh, uh -huh. It, so they, um, uh, you 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 know, if if the machine finds that it one quantity is seems to be controlling most things well maybe it's actually another quantity which is just highly correlated with it um, and if so so in fact actually we uh, we um you know we actually did put in a quantity which was dependent on the others so the sixth one this cusp volume this is actually just the longitudinal translation times by the imaginary part of original translation is just the product of the first two um, we put it in because it has its own natural interpretation so we put in quantities that although they might depend on other quantities they have their own they have their own interpretation because we thought that the that the the network might you know well might be able to use those more profitably um but I know what you're trying to say. You hope you're saying that. Can I put in some linear quantities and sort of try? Or maybe to... not linear, or yeah. could be algebraic yeah. or function. Like 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 in yeah. your case, it's actually uh, 
a cube times an inverse cube, something like that? Yeah, right. You know, um, I, I think putting them in as inputs is not the way to do it. But, but the um, it, it is, I think, a, a cru I mean, for this whole process, it's a crucial question, which is how do you go from knowing that certain quantities are and play an important role to know to actually getting to a formula a potential formula that relates yes. the input quantities to the output this is not this is not um well understood there's no there's there, there are there are there are programs that do do this you yeah you, you, know, you can um you can plug in um a whole load of you know you put in a whole load of inputs here's you say here's the output and then uh, you know, you use what's called symbolic regression to try to find the quantity, the, the, the relationship. I have to say, it doesn't work very well. Um, okay. Uh, I think it's a, 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 an important area. You know, to push this method forward, that is an important area that needs to be developed. I see. And maybe just another quick question: your proof, like the actual proof, has nothing to do with this. You? No, no. I mean, we uh, it, it used. Um, yeah, uh, essentially use the insights from the highly twisted stuff. But no, we um, the actual proof uh, involves the way it works. I just summarize it. I, I, I would like to have said more, but I didn't really have time. So the signature uh, is defined in terms of a ciphered surface. Right? So you take a ciphered surface and you define it in terms of that. It turns out that uh, Old work of Gordon and Litherland says that actually you can compute the signature not by taking a cipher surface of the knot, but taking a spanning surface that might potentially be non orientable using the so called Geritz form. And um, uh, so, what we did was we started with the hyperbolic geometry. And using the hyperbolic geometry, we were able to construct a spanning surface whose boundary was basically the natural slope of the knot. And then we were then able to then apply Gordon Lilithan's theorem, which says that um, that you can compute the signature using that spanning surface. And that way we were able to go from the hyperbolic geometry with via this surface to the signature. So that's kind of in overview the way the proof worked, but it didn't use machine learning. The proof did not use machine learning. I see. Thank you so much. Is this spanning surface minimal area by any chance? Uh, good question. Um, actually, that's a really good question. So it it certainly it it's doesn't have minimal area, but necessarily, but it, it certainly well, it's a normal surface. So in some sense, like it's got combinatorial minimal area or at least combinatorial stable um yeah you know that's a really good question like i i when you're faced with a problem of like how do i relate the hyperbolic geometry to the signature it's really hard you know it's like it's it's you have in some sense it's you have the the you, you can go down any possible route. We looked at lots and lots of different routes. Um, and like we did think about minimal surfaces um, as a natural thing to do in some sense, because, you know, it relates to the geometry, but it also is surfaces and therefore relating to signature. Um, we also looked at other relationships. So, for example, um, uh, there are integral formulas, four-dimensional integral formulas for signature, um, trying to relate them to the geometry. Um, I, I, I think that actually there may be other, that this, I have a feeling that there may be other routes to theorems like this. Do you think there's any chance of um... Getting relationships between, say, coefficients in my favorite knot polynomial and hyperbolic geometry. <laughs> yes, in fact, there's more than a chance of it. So, in fact, there was a, a very, pa a very interesting uh, paper that came out on the archive uh, yesterday, I think, uh, by Hughes and others, um, uh, 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 where 
they did exactly this. They sort of automated what we did and looked at multiple different inputs and multiple different outputs. And like, for example, um, looking at uh, the relationship between, um, uh, say, volume and um, evaluations of the Jones polynomial or longitudinal translation and evaluations of the Jones polynomial. Um, we'd also, I should say, we'd also looked, we'd, we'd, we'd been investigating that as well. I think there's some really interesting patterns there, which the machine learning, their machi they use machine learning to, to detect patterns, and there's some interesting patterns there. It's very hard to interpret, like to come up with a conjecture that formulate, like that gives you the, uh, like the relationships between the Jones and these these geometric quantities. I mean, we were somewhat inspired by the the volume conjecture, which said that like the asymptotics of the colored Jones polynomials should control the volume. Um, but you can broaden that out to saying, let's look at lots of different hyperbolic quantities and lots of different quantities associated with Jones and its friends, and um, and and yeah, there definitely there are lots of interesting patterns out there to explore. Yeah. Mark, I, I had a question. Uh, it's oh, John Luke. Uh, yeah. So so once you had the surface, how do you get the? I mean, I still don't see how you get the signature from knowing the surface. What's the? Well, uh, yeah, right. So, uh, yeah, so I, I, I apologize. I didn't really uh, focus on the proof. So um, uh, Gordon Litherland says that um, the signature of uh, the knot is equal to the signature of the Goritz form plus a correction term. And the correction term is basically the boundary slope of the relevant surface. Um, so what we do is we get a surface whose genus is controlled just by geometrically, controlled by the volume, say, or volume times by the inverse cube of the injectivity radius. And so therefore the signature of that Goritz form is controlled geometrically. You mean just as and, a bound, just as an upper bound or something? or Yeah, just as an upper bound, exactly, yeah. And therefore what really matters is the boundary slope of that surface. And that turns out we've arranged geometrically to be equal to the, the natural slope. But I feel like there's more to be done there. I mean, you know, just viewing the the, the signature of the Goetz form as an error term is clearly like unsatisfactory. I'd like to do more. I'd like, I feel like we should be able to get a better approximation to the signature geometrically. Mm -hmm. Oh, very neat, very neat. Nice talk. Thanks. Thanks, John. Okay, if there are no other questions, we'll thank our speaker for a terrific talk.